start show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Torn Tuesday. Welcome. You're well, you're a weekly dose of all things <laughs> Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and Ooh. everything in between. And welcome, everybody, and welcome. And everything in between, that means Unfinished Tales, The Silmarillion, and the tale, uh, 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 Book of Lost Tales, and all the other things that are real nerdy. We're going to get nerdy, and we're going to get down into the granular depths of conversation. And the with, Rings of Power with, is with, in the middle of all that. With all of you, we're going to be talking about how the Rings of Power it's dark has... In here, isn't it? Isn't it? Let's turn some lights on, shall yeah, we? Yeah, turn some lights on and tell everybody about episode three. I can't tell you guys, but episode three has now arrived here on your television sets. For those of you who haven't heard uh, anything at all, maybe, maybe it's news to some of you, <laughs> but we have... Uh, we have a little TV show that has arrived. Suddenly, a TV show that you may or may not have heard something about in the news, maybe. It's called The Lord of the Rings, colon, The Rings of Power. And we're gonna talk to you about episode three and how it is, uh, how it is being received by the fans, how everybody is energetically blowing up the interwebs, talking about uh, Numenor, our very first on-screen adaptation of the island continent of Numenor. Beautiful, amazing stuff, really beautiful stuff. And I wanna say hello to everybody in the chat room, but by way of regular housekeeping, let's make a general announcement. Welcome, welcome to Torn Tuesday. That is our playful acronym for the One Ring.net. You are here with Justin Sewell and myself, Clifford Broadway, and you're here with us from New all with around. Improved lighting. With some better lighting. That looks good, man. That looks really nice. Hola, buenas tardes. Oh, yes. Sauron is among us. Uh, the chat room is blowing up. We are live on all the platforms we can. It's a lot of platforms. Uh, Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, any anywhere they'll let us uh, uh, put this <laughs> content. Um, yes. We are live, and we're happy to be here with you. Remember, remember Stick Cam all those years ago? That's where we started. Well, you know, That's where we started. Some of you are old enough to remember Stick Cam. We've been doing this show for over 10 years now. The Wondering.net's been around since my, for 20 years. My since goodness. 1999. My goodness and, gracious. And Cliff, in the meantime, not only were you on the wall at Minas Tirith, if you freeze frame the, in the Return of the King, you can see this man in Gondorian glory. Um, Cliff also produced Ringers, Lord of the Fans, a feature-length award-winning documentary about all things fandom and Tolkien over the years. An interesting examination, but, but not a literary examination, but rather the movie was a pop culture examination. We were looking at rock and roll people and how they responded to Tolkien. Had a great interview with Geddy Lee from Rush. And Lemmy Kilmister, I got to interview Lemmy before he passed on. Speaking great, of people great that, stuff, people really great stuff. passed on, you also interviewed Uncle Forey. Forrest J. Ackerman, who created Famous Monsters of Filmland. Godfather of fantasy right there. But he's also the guy who took that weird Zimmerman script to okay. Tolkien, and Tolkien didn't like it. One of the most famous literary takedowns is in one of Tolkien's published letters because he just nuclear blasted the script that uh, Forrest Ackerman had brought to him. It was amazing. That's it's right. amazing. You've got to read and, that. And You've Ringers got to read that. not only was the final really interview, good. one of the final interviews with Lemmy Kilmeister and, uh, <laughs> uh, and all these other people, um, but uh, it also features uh, all of your favorite uh, interviews and... Um, you know, we hope to uh, connect with uh, uh, some of those classic people. But Cliff, I wanted to yes. bring up, yes. you mentioned people that have passed on that were featured in Ringer's Lord of the Fans. Uh, yesterday was Ian Holmes' 91st birthday. Oh, how I miss Ian Holm. Ian Holmes' 91st birthday. Ian Holm, the great, the late, great Ian Holm. So fantastic. And, and it was funny, um, you know, the Queen of England uh, died a week ago. Yes, the Queen and, of England has all passed on. Yes, and, she has uh, and, also. And uh, I was looking up who she knighted from Lord of the Rings. She never knighted J.R.R. Tolkien. That is true. Professor Tolkien was never knighted, was never given an he OBE. He got a, a commander of the British Empire. He got a CBE. Yeah, he got a CBE, but not an OBE. That's he, right. Yeah, an OBE yeah. is a knight. But, yeah. but Cliff, in my research... 
they, uh, the Queen Elizabeth II knighted six actors featured in Lord of the Rings. The obvious one at the top of the list would be Sir Ian McKellen, yes? Go ahead, keep going. Okay, and who else would there be? Would there be uh, Sir Ian Holm? Two. Right, that's two. Keep going. Uh, Sir Peter Jackson, right? He does Was he? No, not. Am I mistaken? He has a knighthood in New Zealand, but not from Queen Elizabeth. Oh, and Sir Richard Taylor? Richard Taylor is, uh, again, not from Queen Elizabeth. Okay. He hey, is a New Zealand Okay, okay, my mistake, knighting. my mistake. Okay. So, all right, you're, you're, you're still on two. Two. Who else? Okay, who Ian else? Ian Holm, Ian McKellen, and? Uh, looking for somebody else with the name of Ian in the cast. No, no, I'm joking. keep going. That's a joke. Uh, yeah. No, 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 let me yeah. guess. Um, uh, did she offer a knighthood to... Um, uh, Garfa Mayo in the chat room is correct. It is... Sir. Sir Christopher Lee. Sir oh, Christopher that should Lee. have been so obvious to me. That should have been so obvious. All right, that's three. You're right. That's three. Sir Christopher Lee. You guys, keep going. Um, who else? Who else got knighted from, from uh, an actor in Lord of the Rings? Who else was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II? Um, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I, I don't really know. Let's spill the beans then. I don't remember. Well, I don't remember that. I'm asking you. You are asking me. Oh, because we're looking it up. Okay, now we're going to need the chat people to fill us in on the... Okay, I, I don't recall, but the top three would be Chris Chris Lee, Ian Holm, Ian McKellen. Top three. Okay. And I don't remember the rest, honestly. Uh, well, I'll give you number four. Sir Billy Connolly. Oh, oh, I Sir forgot. Sir Billy Connolly, but that's you said, four. You said Lord of the Rings, and he was not in I, the Lord of the in Rings. In Lord... Lord of the Rings is everything. No way. Middle Earth. If you let's had just, said, if you had said, if you had said from Peter Jackson's six movies, then I could have figured that out. Wow. Uh, okay. Erica in the chat room. Thank you, Erica, for the confirmation. Any knighthood bestowed on a subject of the Commonwealth came from the Queen. New Zealand is part of the Commonwealth. I stand corrected. Cliff, you are correct. Sir Richard Taylor. Sir Peter Jackson. Sir Richard Taylor and Sir Peter Jackson. Yes, 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 okay, yes, yes. Okay, so, so uh, Wait, we were up to four. Wait, did someone say Dame, Dame Kate Blanchett said Cooperman? Is no, that right? Kate no. Kate is not. Gosh. Kate is not. Well, so we she have, should be. We have Richard Taylor. Uh, that's five. We have Peter Jackson. That is six. Uh, I, my, I need one more. My first, my first request to you, King Charles, is to offer knighthood to Kate Blanchett right now. Do it now. Immediately. Before you finish with all the other funeral of your mama, just give Kate a new knighthood. Do that. Well, Cliff, thank you. I am happy to report. I'm happy to report that. I'm joking, of course. The Hobbit had two, no, three knights of the British Empire. Lord of the Rings had three knights of the British Empire. That's five. And Rings of Power has a knight. Of the British Empire, really? can you name no. the knight, the official knight from Queen Elizabeth II, in the Rings of Power? Sir Lenny Henry. Oh! Oh! Let's go to the surprise guest of the night. Oh my gosh, who is here with us, ladies? Jed and Brophy, La what are you doing here? Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is Jed Brophy, right here, right here. Kia ora koutou, kia ora koutou, uh, G. Brophy Aho, it's me, G. Brophy, here in Aotearoa, Middle East, New Zealand. So you're, you're back wow. in New Zealand now, huh? I am indeed, yeah. That is beautiful. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, the, tw the tweets, the Twitter was a buzz this week, as you finally confirmed. I'm uh, so excited about in this. In many ways, uh, <laughs> that uh, you are an orc in Rings of Power. Now, uh, Jed, my first question is, how could you keep that a secret from us for so long? Yeah. Yeah, look, it wasn't easy. Um, we, we talked to uh, you guys over Christmas. I was at Roy's house, and I, I, I've known for a long time, and I've, you know, I signed an NDA saying I couldn't talk about it until it was on TV, and I take that stuff pretty seriously. They would have been unhappy if I'd mentioned anything, um, but it certainly was difficult keeping it from you guys. Um, I think actually, you you may have spilled the beans before I did in San Diego, but um, <laughs> it was difficult to keep it a secret. It was. Uh, we had a uh, we had 
many opportunities to spoil many things over the last two years. We've spoiled some of it. Uh, we got a few things wrong, and some things just were never confirmed, right? We, exactly. We heard whispers of your involvement, uh, and you know, when you, uh, after the pandemic kind of resumed, um, after the first pandemic stop, uh, you kind of like went MIA on us, and we couldn't get you down for an interview or anything like that. Um, so I, we had some inclinations, but never any concrete confirmation. And even at Comic Con. Yeah, where like we we spilled the beans on so much, um, not even a wisp of a whisper on it. So, uh, uh, Jed, this must be just a huge um, relief to kind of get this secret off your chest. Yeah, it is. Look, I, this is I've I've made no um, pretense that this is my very favorite set of books. It's my favorite franchise. I felt incredibly honored to be involved in the first three films, and then to come back on the Hobbit. It's kind of like Tolkien, his writing has given me a, an entire career on film. <clears throat> I've done other stuff, of course, but there is nothing that makes me happier than working in this particular realm of literature and on film. And so it was very difficult for me not to be able to tell family or friends what I was doing, um, share images, because I love to do that. You know, I'm, I'm all over Instagram and I love to be able to tell people what I'm doing. So it was very difficult from a, a work point of view too to be able to not to be able to say anything but yeah i'm absolutely thrilled to be in back in this world i i think they're doing an amazing job they've got an amazing group of actors and um, crew and um, artisans working on it as usual and uh yeah it's a huge a huge thrill to be a part of the series that's for sure uh correct me if i'm wrong but this would make you the first if not the only. Oh, here we go. Actor yes. Yes, that it's true. Spans all six films plus plus more. Film, plus the new yes. power. You are yes. you are the singular connective tissue that fans have desired. I think it's wild, really. Yeah. I don't, I don't know, mate. I mean, that's possibly true. I, um, and if and if it is true, then I'll I'll claim that that's that's fantastic. I, I, I didn't think I was going to be involved in the series. They, they were pretty clear that they wanted to um, create their own kind of vision, a new vision, and and not 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 perhaps have people from the from the films. Um, and I was as surprised as anyone. I, I remember we talked way back at the beginning when they were first casting it, and you asked if I'd be involved, and I was like, I don't think so. But I'm happy for anyone that is, and and I meant that. I was you know genuinely pleased for anyone that I knew who was going to be working on it. But yeah, it came as a shock, a surprise, and um, and a huge thrill to, to yeah, to kind of be the thread that goes through of all of, all of those um, parts of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and uh, Tolkien's work that's been shot in, in, my, in my country. Well, if, uh, if folks haven't seen the tweet about you've seen episode three, let's bring it up on screen. Jed, what is the name of... As well, um, but mainly mainly chasing elves and burning villages are the things that he really likes to do on his weekends. Um, oh my goodness, uh, internet! It's just, just wonderful, really, really wonderful to have uh, uh, you here with us. And the internet has been blowing up, really blowing up. And I know there's so much uh, jiggery pokery behind <laughs> the scenes right now. Uh, it looks like when I showed that picture on screen, the audio muted. That, and that was a glitch. So, Jed, can you repeat uh, what your character's name is? Um, he's Vrath. Um, he's, um, he's Vrath. He's one of the orcs that we haven't seen for a thousand years. And, you know, these orcs, um, they're probably closer to the origins of the orcs than the ones that we played in the, in the um, Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. These are kind of first generation of the orcs bred probably that's kind of the backstory we sort of came up with 
Um, very, very similar to the ones that you see further down the line, but kind of uh, first generation, if you like. And uh, so, uh, obviously, you are very well versed in the lore of the books, and you've worked with Peter Jackson uh, for 20 years on, on the other movies and uh, how thrilling it is to jump on this. You, you mentioned that they want to set the new course. Um, when it comes to this character, you, you just mentioned that this orc might be one of the first orcs. Um, did they give you kind of a, a background for your character or this race of characters, or did you and the other stunties and actors under prosthetics kind of develop a, a mythology for your characters? Good question. Yeah, that mythology had kind of, some of that work had been done for us. Um, we Because myself and, and some of the other players, uh, we've, we've been in, in earlier versions of, um, of Orkdom and Ork Makeup. We collectively, with um, some of the, the people who'd written the scripts, the showrunners, came up with the idea that these are probably the first of the Orcs that were bred, not elves that were taken and, and, and tortured and changed by Morgoth, but probably these are ones who have been bred specifically. Um, so they're closer to the ones from the, from the um, you know, the War of Tears, they're closer to those orcs than the ones further down the line. They haven't been broken by years and years of war. Um, they have their own ethos. You know, they have their own family. One of the things that was important to us as a group is to try and get people to understand that the orcs aren't just these funny bad guys that are there to be kind of cannon fodder, that they have their own family dynamic. They have their own history. They have their own wants and needs. And they're just wanting to reclaim some of their homeland. You know, they're wanting to, they wanted to come in and feel like they actually belong in Myrtle Earth as much as any other race. So rather than just ah. being, you know, that was that was very important to all of us that they are a race of beings who feel like they have been hard done by as much as they're not just the enemy. We don't know that we're the enemy. We think that this is our tangata venom. This is our land, and that we belong here just as much as anyone else. This is look at look at what people are saying here in the live chat. There's so many great responses from people, and here on Twitter, uh, the really funny one that just came from Garfe Mao. Uh, she says that Twitter wants to see Orc Jed Brophy fight with Elf Jed Brophy, with the Dwarf Jed Brophy commentating on the fight from the margins. <laughs> Doesn't that that would be quite the extra special DVD uh, Blu-ray extra, wouldn't it? Well, what we can do. <laughs> On green screen and with motion capture, we could definitely make that happen. You know, we could, we could uh, take Nori from the Hobbit and we could take um, the elf <laughs> that I played in Lord of the Rings and put them with the, uh, with the orcs from the series, and and we could have a complete crossover. We could have one from every show um, in that particular scenario. I'd be up for it. I'm available. So um, <laughs> hey, you, you heard make... you heard that here, if you, Amazon. If you're watching, Jed is available for this extra bonus. I want to I want to get back to the seriousness of that answer that you just gave us Jed a, a minute ago about the idea that the orcs themselves have evolved to not wanting to suffer from placelessness and not wanting to be uh, just like the forgotten uh, race. They actually want things. They want things that a group of people migrating to find a new home would want to have. And this is a perspective, honestly, that has never been afforded to the orcs because, to be honest, their usefulness in the narrative is to be uh, opposition, monstrous and forceful opposition to the efforts of the heroes. It's the first time that we've been granted any insight into the orcs having their own agency in this way. And I find that really fascinating, except for some interesting conversations that Tolkien wrote between the orcs in The Lord of the Rings, where they talked to themselves about how things used to be better back in the good old days. You know, you remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think when you're, you know, creature actors talk about this all the time, um, people who are stuck in prosthetics, this idea that you're just there for the heroes to have someone to fight, it's a bit belittling. And yeah. as a group, especially the orcs as a group, it's a, you know, there isn't a lot written about, not as much as there is written about the elves, obviously, in the Silmarillion and, um, and other of his works. 
there's not as much written about them either, even as there is about the Kuzdu, um, yes. the, the, the dwarves, or, or even about the Shire folk. And so it was, it was as a group, we kind of, we were given that opportunity by, by the um, producers and showrunners to kind of flesh out a backstory um, about them wanting to have imperatives, you know, wanting to feel like they were safe and that they could um, have a safe place for their families and that kind of thing without giving anything away in terms of what's coming up in the series. That was very important to us as a group as well, that we had this kind of collective ethos. We weren't battling each other. We, um, you know, we don't get on with each other all the time, but we have a kind of, like the dwarves going to Erebor, we have a collective want to feel like we have a place Wow. You know, Morgan, he's gone, he's been dragged away in chains, and we've been left, and we haven't been seen for a thousand years at this point. So, you know, what yeah. happened in that is what has happened to us as a group of people? What things have we talked about? What plans have we made? And it was great to be able to sit around a table and actually have that conversation, not just, there you are, there's your prosthetic, go out and be um, ugly and get slaughtered. <laughs> yeah, wait, you're, you're, wow. you're hinting at a whole wow. culture that has been living on the edges of Middle Earth. Indeed. Families and female orcs and everything like that. Does this mean you are maybe years, just a few years away from developing such a culture that you have restaurants and menus? <laughs> What's to say that they're not already there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, without going that far, it, it is that, that idea, you know, it was nice to be given the opportunity of having a discussion with our, you know, as a group and with our leader, who I won't get into because that's not my place to talk about, but to talk about um, this idea that we have, we have family values. They're, they're different to the rest of the beings of Middle Earth, certainly the orcs and the people, the humans. Um, but we have these kind of wants and needs, and and it's more about not just being nasty, not just being evil in terms of how people see us. We don't see ourselves like that. We we just wanted to inhabit Middle Earth in the way that we want to. We believe that we are destined to, you know, have ownership. Wild. Now, people are asking, can you give any confirmation, yes or no, that we will see female orcs? Can you even say that? I can I can neither confirm nor deny. Okay, <laughs> we, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a good chance to repeat yourself. No, somebody else on the chat was asking about Adar. Can you say anything about who or what Adar really is? I think you need to wait. I think you should wait. Um, for <laughs> exactly. The, the upcoming episode. I don't want to spoil that because. It's not my it's not my place to do that. I, I'm as interested as everybody else in seeing episode four. I can't wait to see what happens next. So I think we should just wait a few days and then you will see. Be be patient. A great question from a, 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 a longtime viewer last win in the chat. And Jed, uh, uh, you know, we're in the year 2022. Is Vrath the orc uh, confirmed a male orc? <laughs> or is he gender neutral? Oh. I, I made the decision that he was a male orc. Um, I came to the conclusion myself that I wanted to play him uh, as a male orc. So he is uh, pronouns he, him. And he is definitely a he, him uh, orc. Yes. Very good. Uh, you talked about uh, orcs just want to uh, get their homeland back. And they, they just want to um, they just want to have a place of their own. And... They, they feel that they have a destiny in Middle Earth, whatever that is. Uh, so, I don't know, man. How do you explain uh, chaining up elves and putting them to work in, in such sl slavery-type conditions there? I mean, that was uh, uh, what we saw in Episode 3 is, is, is pretty gnarly. Those aren't nice orcs. Um, how do you <laughs> come to the conclusion that you're a nice orc? Well, you, you have to remember that those elves, they had watchtowers. Um, and, you know, battlements that they left waiting for any sight of any orcs. And they, as he said, they were going to come and they were going to make us extinct, like get rid of us, get rid of the specks of orcs off the face of Middle Earth. So 
given that they were in that situation where they had people watching over to to see if we came back into into existence, if there was even a hint that they were there, that they were going to wipe us off the planet, you know, we we just really protecting ourselves by chaining them up because they are stronger than us, more able and battle than us, and probably at this point anyway, um, have a lot more uh, people at their disposal, a lot more elves at their disposal to come and do that. So from our point of view, we're just safeguarding um, uh, the, the kind of uh, the dwellings that we currently have. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is so super cool, Jed. I, I'm I'm actually amazed that I'm sold. I'm just this amazed at all this. Show. I'm gonna call this the Orc Show. It's actually I don't want to sound weird, but Jed, your storyline with Arondir and the Orcs, and particularly this encounter with the tree, the tree that stood its ground for just a few moments, is one of the best. It is one of the best and strongest parts of the whole series. I am fascinated by what is going on down there in the land of Nern, which, you know, real southern, way southern Mordor, before it was ever recognized or called Mordor. You know, down where, you know, human beings used to live, and they had it's trees, kind of and they had right farms, they had pastures, they had, you know, it was actual land. This was usable, breathable, arable, land yeah. this was real land i know this is this is i know this is fascinating to see so far back in time before the presence of sauron and his minions turned it all into something else so not only i realize now not only do we get to see the transformation of numenor ultimately get destroyed like atlantis in a spectacular fashion but now over all these seasons we're going to see the slow inexorable evil transformation of Mordor. And that's really deeply fascinating to me. It really is. And you're part of that. That's like the coolest story. I love this story. I love it. It's cool. It's really cool. It absolutely is. I, I, you know, doing those little parts in Lord of the Rings, you don't really get um, an idea of where they have been or what they've been doing. It's kind of pointed at that they've been, you know, breeding and and countless masses up there and behind the Black Gate and, and in Isengard and various other places. But this this is, it's like a proper journey, you know? I, I, I don't know what the future holds in terms of the series. Um, obviously, they 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 will, will be safeguarding um, those storylines. But yeah, I think it's fascinating that they've, that they've tried so hard to show a window into the world of the Orcs that isn't just, you know, like an, a passing thing because they're the enemy. Like these are yet another group of beings from Middle Earth who have a place and a story. And I think that that's really, not only is it wise, it's very brave um, to do that. I think a lot of people, you know, could, could quite rightly have said, well, they're just the enemy. Why do we care? But of course we care because if you understand the enemy, then you, you have a much better grounding as to how the story might evolve for all of the other beings in Middle Earth. You know, we're not just a catalyst for yet another battle, we actually have a journey, which Wait. as you say, transforms the landscape around us for a reason. That is so cool, it is so very, very cool. And a geographical note from uh, our very faithful audience member, Otaku Senpai, who reminds us uh, that Nern is just a little bit further south than the villages that we encounter in the show. Copy that, thank you. You know, but talking to you, Jed, uh, like, this is some deep-seated lore that you are describing. And it, yeah. I, I, Cliff, um, I know you hate it when I opine about, you know, uh, the lore. But the what Jed is describing right now um, makes me believe we all know that nine kings of men are corrupted to Sauron's side. And yes. And, and seven kings of dwarves are corrupted to Sauron's side. I, it had never occurred to me that the orcs were corrupted to Sauron's side. And what Jed's describing here is potentially a, a race of beings equal, you know, that feel that they need their fair equal share of Middle Earth and they just want to live their life and they have, maybe they haven't been corrupted by Sauron yet. 
Maybe. And, and it's another race to corrupt. Maybe that is a fascinating idea. That we're going to learn something about Adar and his relationship with uh, Sauron. And maybe it's not everything that we assume. Maybe there's possibly competition. <laughs> maybe Adar would rather have the orcs allied with himself for his own reasons. Maybe if Sauron slash Anatar shows up in a season two or something, maybe it'll be a whole different approach to a struggle, a struggle within evil powers to maintain control of the population of orcs. That's right. Well, hey, maybe. Uh, Jed, maybe. Say, you, can, you can correct the record for us without being a spoiler. How do you say that dude's name? Is it Adar, 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 a deer, a female deer? Oh, gosh. What, what, how do you say his name? Adar. You, you see me say it to Ar Arondir, actually. Um, I come over the top of his head and I say for Adar, but not for you, or Adar. So I think, the, I think from what Leith, the dialect coach, was saying, the, the emphasis is on the, the uh, the eh, uh, Adar. 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 Indeed. Adar. Indeed. Um, uh, so uh, s switching gears to Jed, the, the personal um, person that loves Lord of the Rings and uh, Middle Earth and the stories and the messages and the lessons of it, um, for us fans watching episode three, and and uh, Aron Deer uh, saying, uh, you know, I will chop down the tree, and him going up to the tree and speaking Elvish to it and say, I'm so sorry. He said, uh, forgive me. Forget. He said, forgive me. Yeah. And if you go on our Discord, um, people have translated every single piece of Elvish that was whispered in that episode. Which is extraordinary. Yeah, I, I just love this fandom. So, um, uh, separate from Vrath the Orc, how was that seen as emotionally powerful from a from a, uh, a a nature standpoint for Jed the man and 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 th that storyline of like apologizing to the tree for what they have to do? Absolutely, it's a very big part of um, the culture in Aotearoa as well. Um, you know, we consider. There are a lot of people in our country who consider themselves to be katiaki, um, the guardians. Um, you know, Tane Mahuta is one of the Māori gods. He's the father of the forest. The trees are very, very important. They're considered in New Zealand to be living entities. Um, they have their own personalities and they're very important. And it behooves all of us to try and look after the native um, flora in New Zealand. So, again, it was an amazing scene because of the uh, caliber of the cast too, you know, Ishmael playing Aaron Deer, he took he took it really seriously. He's kind of for me, from what I saw and said anyway, he's kind of like the Vigo of this series in terms of how he's 120% physically and in terms of what he puts into it. And not taking away from any of the other players in the series because I didn't have as much to do with them as I did with him. But yeah, it's um it was an emotional thing. It was you know, they, they, they take the time to to show the sacred. And I think that that's what is going to set the series apart for people. They do take the time to really um, understand what the beings of Middle Earth, what their imperatives are and what's important to them. And the fact that this, is, this tree has been there for countless eons and it's going to have to be shifted for this bunch of orcs, that would have been very painful for, for an elf and especially for this character. Amazing. Do you know what? Uh, one additional thought has come in from other really intriguing conversations that the fans have had on Twitter. And one of them speculated that in a future season, a Ron Deere will come face to face with one of the Ents or one of the Ent wives and will have oh. to apologize and ask for forgiveness for what he did in episode three, season one. Mm -hmm. And that actually would be a, the kind of that is the richness of what we can discover in these stories of the Second Age. I think it is an excellent example of the kinds of things that the storytellers and the writers in the writer's room for Rings of Power can actually do for us as for fans. To imagine, we've never seen those conversations, but imagine the guilt that Arondir would have to process and go through and seeking perhaps absolution from one of the ancient shepherds of the trees. I can imagine it would be 
And it's just an, it's just an idea that somebody speculated on on Twitter, but that is an example of the richness of this wide field of story that we can get into. And I'm really delighted to see this happening. I really am. The, um, uh, uh, and if you, uh, if you guys watched uh, the Emmys last night, of course, Lord of the Rings wasn't nominated yet because it just came out and it'll probably qualify and maybe get nominated next year. But our pal, our Ron Deere, Ismail Cruz Cordova, was a presenter uh, last night at mm-hmm. the Emmy, so oh, you know, <laughs> yes, he was. Uh, you know, we've talked about. Uh, you heard Jed just talked about. Um, you know, uh, he f- there's uh, there's a kinship to um, Vigo's performance uh, back then. Um, you know, and I want to remind fans uh, when Benedict Cumberbatch was cast in The Hobbit, uh, he was a no name. Um, he hadn't even done Sherlock yet. In fact, we had to find an audio book of the Jabberwocky to give fans a sense of what his voice would sound like <laughs> as a dragon. That's right. Because well, he just was a no name. And pretty much the whole cast, no one had heard of Richard Armitage or anybody else. Um, and same with Lord of the Rings. So I, I get, and Jed, you were there the whole step of the way watching these unknown actors like Orlando Bloom become massive, massive stars. And then in The Hobbit, all of these. You know, the Hobbit was just a, a star maker for for many of those actors. Um, are you? Uh, yeah. d- do you think that this show, Rings of Power, is going to have the same influence on some of these actors' careers? Oh, absolutely. I I, I was at San Diego with you guys, and it was great that you, Justin, managed to get me to go and, and see all those guys and shake their hands. And I know from being on set um, when we were filming it, I I to a couple of those actors, I said, "Man, this is." I hope you know that this is going to completely change your life because this is a huge fan base, but not only that, it's a really embracing fan base. They will lift you up because it means so much to them. And um, I don't think it kind of resonated with them then, but I think post San Diego and post the premieres, I think that they know now what this is going to mean for the rest of their career in terms of what it can do for them, the doors that it can open. I think coming out, of, uh, out of, coming out of Comic-Con, I think you and I had talked a little bit about who's, who, who has it, you know? There's, a, there's <laughs> this thing in Hollywood, it's like, they've, they've got it, whatever it is, star power. And, and the it quality. The it factor. Yeah, the it um, factor. And besides yeah. Ismail Cordova, who's definitely a star ready to burst, um, yeah. Theo, the actor that plays Theo, seems like he's just got it. Yeah, um, and interesting. And, you know, he grew up on the set. He was, you know, he kind of gained nearly a foot in height during the filming. It was um, interesting from that point of view. But a bit like um, John Hunter Bell, who played um, Bard's son in The Hobbit, um, same thing there, you know, from when he started to when he finished, he was, he, he'd grown up as a young man. He'd gone through teenager and became a man. And it's the same for Theo. And he's a lovely young man. He's got his feet firmly on the ground. Um, he's got family values. His mum was there the whole time that they were filming, and uh, I got on really well with him. It's fun, yeah. fun, fun, kind of hanging out and just seeing his eyes just get bigger and bigger, you know, each day in terms of the things that he was seeing. And one of the great things about working on these particular, this particular franchise, is the artisan, is the artistry that you get to see every day. Um, it's not just that we get to work on amazing sets; it's also amazing costumes, amazing costumers. And uh, he was really into that. He was really into, you know, the different stuff that they were coming up with and the amazing sets. And, yeah, he's a fine young man, and he's going to go places he really is because he's, he's humble but very talented. Uh, he's, we, one we, of my, he's one of my favorite people to interview. He's great. Interviewing him is great. He's awesome. Uh, Tyro is his name. Muhafidin. I, I'm saying his last name very wrong. Muhafidin. 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 Um, yeah. Tyro, there you go. Tyro is his name. Cliff, you actually interviewed him as uh, because you went to the press junket and you mm-hmm. interviewed almost all the actors. Let me ask you, how does ha, you interviewed the press junket for Lord of the Rings and then you were involved in the Hobbit? How does this cast compare as far as like the that that early awkwardness, like you know, you you interviewed the cast oh, of, of yeah. Lord of the Rings twenty years ago before they were stars, right? Like, right. Do you see any comparisons to this cast? Actually, yeah, there are some really simple and direct parallels with this cast the, uh, compared to 
interviewing other members in the previous uh, six films. And the energy of enthusiasm is a match. This is a remarkable uh, e equilibrium, I think, between both casts. They're wildly enthused about the work that they are doing. Why? Because they're excited to bring J.R.R. Tolkien to life. That, in particular, seems to be the greatest common denominator. When I interview the new folks, you know, Owain, Arthur, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, Tyro, and everybody, um, and uh, the, the beautiful, uh, luminous uh, Sophia Namvete. When I interview them, I get the same energy from 20 years ago with, you know, Liv Tyler and Orlando and, and Billy Boyd. Everyone's just saying, oh, we're chomping at the bit for you to see more of what we have created. We are so enthused and cannot They're wait. They're saying that again. They're saying it again. We cannot wait for you to enter into this realm that we've created and soak it all in and look at all the hard work that we put into it. So that there's a great energy constant between all of them. Jed, do you, do, do, does this, do, does the caliber of work put into this show um, feel familiar to uh, how it felt 20 years ago on Peter Jackson's movie? Hmm. It really does. And one of the great things for me is that there were, there were people who had worked um, 20 years ago on The Lord of the Rings, um, Matt and Emily from Weta, um, they were running the latex kind of dragon skin that we're wearing as the orcs in the pit there. Um, the prosthetics, uh, you know, the prosthetic, the facial prosthetics um, were, were done at Weta Workshop. Um, a lot of the sets were built by people who'd worked on of those, you know, uh, construction people who'd worked on those sets 20 years ago as well. And there was a kind of familiarity in terms of wanting it to be as glorious as possible. And they didn't leave a stone unturned. They really, I mean, you've seen Numenor episode three. Oh, my goodness. The miniatures, um, the, the special effects used in that aerial shot, that's so reminiscent of... Um, you know, Isengard or Minas Tirith from back in the day. It's, it's the same feel of wanting to get it right because it's so important to so many people. This yeah. franchise, they, they will be, they won't hold back in terms of being critical if it's not good enough. And so there was that feeling that we have to aim really, really high from every single person, from the people dressing us in the morning um, right up to the people building the sets and the direction and everything. Everybody was aiming high because it's important. Absolutely. Do you know how beautiful it is that you just revealed one of the big mysteries that all the fans have been talking about? You just said the words, dragon skin. Oh, Yes, we've been Cliff, speculating. Don't, don't make him nervous. I love He's it. He's talking right now. Don't, um, make, don't point out things. <laughs> I'm just saying it's wonderful that so many of the fans have speculated, was that snake skin? What was this weird reptilian? Uh, it looks like the creature had molted and left the skin behind. But wow, it's dragon skin. How cool. Well... Yeah, um what, what, one of the things we talked about and one of the things that was um, really hammered home to us every day is that these orcs are very super sensitive to the sun. Um, Elrond Deer and the other elves talk about that in the pit in episode three, so I'm not giving anything away there, but we have to have something so that we can actually venture into the daylight that actually protects us from the sun. And these would have been um, dragons when they were cold drakes before they are uh, fire breathing, probably when they're young. You know, this would be the... The, the, the very young dragon skins probably molting that we have found and um, made as part of our, our um, armor and uniform. That's so cool. It is very, um, very cool. Why? Because, I mean, it's, it's a good symbolic representation that we're getting a fresh take on J.R.R. Tolkien. And that's what this entire endeavor is about is to give us a thoughtful... What about their takes? A, a thoughtful... They're fresh. Yeah, br what about their takes? They're fresh. That's a fresh take. And so I appreciate that so much. Um, An acknowledgement to Matt, Nerd of the Rings, who is with us here in the live chat. And earlier today, I was deep, deeply watching and appreciating his conversation with Lloyd Owen. Elendil. Uh, Elendil. Um, Jed, you are working on a different unit 
uh, with uh, Aron Deer. Did you get to mix and mingle with any of the other performers uh, like Morfith, Clark, or uh, Lloyd Owen at any of the other units? I got to work with um, with her, with, with our wonderful um, Galadriel. Um, so did I get to work? Yeah, I got to see her in her armor on set one day. Let's just say that. Um, <laughs> I, I got to meet um, Owain and Robert. I, w I got to go over on their set when they were doing some of the stuff inside Kazakh Doom, um, which was amazing, actually, because, of course, he's my forefather from from The Hobbit. He's Durin. He's I'm one of Durin's folks. So to actually get to kind of hang with him, and I sat next to him in makeup. Um, he had his makeup artist who does his makeup. Also, Simon Rose also did my makeup for, for Wrath. So... There were days when we were having to share a makeup bus and share an artist. Um, did did, so did, you, did you kind of tease him that uh, uh, Casa Doom is yours first? Like you were here no, first. <laughs> no, I, I was really. I just I loved the fact that they were great mates in the show, but also offset. Like they were sitting there chatting in a tent when I when um, the dialect coach uh, took me and introduced me, and it was just great to see that camaraderie that I had kind of had on, on you know, the earlier incarnations had kind of carried through and they were taking it very seriously. Owain especially, he's a he's a huge rugby fan, as am I. You know, he's Welsh, so there's that kind of, there's that kind of brotherly thing that New Zealanders and Welsh have anyway. And I really, I think what he's doing with Duran is just amazing. Um, yeah, no one had a bad thing to say about him. They said he was the hardest worker and an amazing person. And, and as as a fellow Kuzdul, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see him kind of take take that part and do so much with it. Um, so go, go I'm, I think the <laughs> dwarven culture is the most realized um, visually that we've seen in the show thus far. Uh, I, I um, You know, one of the controversies that has popped up since episode three uh, dropped um, no, there haven't been any controversy. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but no, this is a very specific lore controversy. And I'll ask Cliff first, and then I'll, I want to get your opinion, Jed. Uh, Cliff, in the show, we see these orcs, including Jed's character, I think, um, start smoking in the sun and start burning up. As far as I know, and I don't know much, that uh, only, those, only the big three trolls turn to stone in the sun, and the, these tro the, these uh, trolls or orcs, these orcs that are in the second age shouldn't be burning up in the sun. What does the lore have to say about that? Uh, it, they don't literally burn up like vampires, but um, it slows them down because it hurts in a way. They don't like it. It is sort of like a metaphysical idea because the light of the sun and moon are from heavenly sources. And uh, it is the idea, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphysical spiritual idea, not that they're burned by you know, the skin getting exposed to sunlight, but in television, we're dealing with visual representation to make things translate to the audience in a much easier way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe I could lay this at the feet of you know, the way they do things for television audiences. Um, uh, but it's, uh, what do you think, Jeff, Jed? It's, you know, it, it's not like vampirism. It's more like being uh, um, what you'd call slowed down or agonized, just agonized by the, the light. If you think about very, very fair skin, um, 10 minutes in the sun in New Zealand and you're burning, you know, like that than it is in terms of like vampires burning up. If you if you think that they haven't been um, visible in the daylight for a thousand years, we haven't seen, the elves have not seen orcs in Middle Earth for a thousand years at this oh. point. So if we've only been going out at night or we've, you know, we've only been going out protected, we would be, we would have kind of developed over generations a sensitivity to the sun. And if you remember, um, Seldomar bred the Urukai so that they could actually go out in the daylight because the Yorks were still sensitive to the sun in the Third Age. So this is, this is kind of a, an evolution of nature, mm. not a, uh, a, a holy divinity of, of affectation against the sun. I get it. So. I think it's probably a 
probably a combination of all of those things. But just just logically in terms of what we were thinking in our head is it's it's more the fact that if you think of um, creatures who live in you know in creeks and in the caves that never see the sunlight, they they lose their vision because they don't need it. Um, they lose the the pigment of their skin because of the fact that they're not getting sun. And it would be the same generationally with these with these orcs if they've not been, you know, they've been they they don't want to be visible. They they were slaughtered to almost extinction in the um, in the War of Tears of the War of Wrath when Morgoth was dragged off, and so they don't want to be seen. They don't want people to know that they exist. So they've been hiding out. Okay. Uh, can I posit that wow. uh, by sh by showing the skin of the orcs uh, steaming in the sun when we first meet them in episode one, um, can I posit that maybe this gives s whoever's in charge a reason to have the volcano erupt and cover all of Mordor in uh, shadow to shadow the sun. Smoke. It's to shadow it, the sun. It, to, to, to make you to make your orc lives easier. It's not about corrupting uh, a green and fertile land. It's just to, about making your existence more comfortable. Uh, and I like that idea. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny any of this. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Jed, I love you, Jed. <laughs> uh, Jed, he's just trying to do it, and he's trying to do it right. Ladies and gentlemen, I want everybody in the live chat to give a big round of applause right now for Jed Brophy, who is walking the tightrope for us, just to be able to talk with us about he the rings of power. He, he can't. It, we don't want spoilers. Everybody, just yeah, and, give and, little and, clapping and, emojis. And, and I the, want clapping emojis and the bosses in the don't chat. Want, okay, no, so no spoilers. I'm so excited to have you here, Jed, but I don't want Wait, to get you in trouble. I re really, you know. Uh, all right, so without getting you in trouble, I, I'm curious. You, you keep mentioning this orc culture. So, uh, you know, <laughs> when uh, I, I guess when we heard first heard about Harfoots, and then we first heard about Lenny Henry, uh, there were we had months of discussion of is Lenny Henry like a day player like he's in one or two episodes and that's it turns out no he flew to New Zealand three or four times for a giant role mm -hmm. um, so without giving away how big your role is 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 there any way you can kind of give us an idea like how many episodes you think you might be in or how many pages of script that you had to read uh, throughout this thing a a any hint of like how much orc culture plays into season one? You're gonna get him in trouble. From 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 episode three through to the end, you see orcs in every episode. That's just yeah. So they're, here, they're here to stay. Yeah, they're here to stay. Yeah, they're here to stay. We they haven't been seen for a thousand years, but now that they have been seen, they're not going away. Interesting. Interesting. Indeed. Um, Indeed. Well done. Was it? Was there? So, did you? Um, did you follow all of the gossip and rumors of the making of this show for the last three years? Was there a? If you followed any of it, was there a particular rumor that you thought was really funny, whether true or completely off base? Was there something that was just like, <laughs> that's great? Look, I was really hoping that they would take Ian McKellen's bait and 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 uh, bring him in as Gandalf. <laughs> you know, I really, I was really hoping, and also I kind of also hoped that there might be the potential of um, of seeing a young Aragorn in there somewhere. You know, that, that those are the two things that excited me. Just because I love those two actors so much, it would have been great to have them come back and and be sprinkled in there somewhere. I knew that it's not possible because it's the second age, but those are two of the rumors that I thought were were kind of cool. Um, uh, and just also where the material was coming from, you know, what what part of the of the of the earlier books that they were going to use, you know, I was kind of hoping that they go right from the beginning, and we get to see all of the valor. Yeah. That for me would be just, just amazing. I'm I, curious I'm to I'm curious to speculate about uh, the tunnel. Why are you not digging the tunnel further and further underground to build a surface? kind of surface tunnel with all the tarp over it um it's a, it's a different approach i'm curious did you guys talk about that because i haven't quite figured out in my brain what the what the approach is to this 
I think you're going to have to wait and see. I think that okay. I might be giving away things that I will get me into trouble if I talk about that too much. Okay, uh, fair enough. You know, if you're digging underground, there are still going to be things that you come up against. They're going to be um, geological or geographical things that you come up against that you can maybe not continue to dig underground. Um, that's a possibility um, without saying yes or no. Uh, I, I'm hard to speculate. Uh, it's hard to speculate without without yeah I, I, a, okay I, I get what you're saying <laughs> That's my, fair my enough. totally my, fair my theory is uh, they're building an aqueduct and they're they're going above ground now so they can get to the sea of Nern and drain it into all of the tunnels and that becomes a new underground yeah. kind of uh, plumbing system for Mordor and all of the things that are about to happen but intriguing. I have I have no knowledge of anything I'm just a guy on the internet what I really love are the people on Twitter who either quickly or slowly start to recognize that they see Mount Doom in the background of many wide shots in the Southlands. And it's not even called Mount Doom. Maybe the elves don't even call it Orodruin, which is the elvish name, but everybody who's a sharp-eyed observer, they've been talking about it and sharing these beautiful screen caps on Twitter and other uh, formats that you can often see Orodruin in the far background of a lot of those shots. And it's just a tease. It is such a cool, hidden, well, it's not hidden, it's in plain sight, but it's there as a visual cue for those who know to look for it. Uh, well, uh, and, uh, let me. Let, that's a good intro into the question, is how much of your stuff was shot outside versus on a soundstage with a green screen? Um, well, that... All of the stuff in the tunnel there is outside. That was a real set um, outside uh, in the in the back lot of the studio there in Henderson. And in fact, the majority of stuff that we did was shot um, outside in the in, in in various locations. So yeah, there was some stuff on the soundstage. It was a it was a good mix, like it was probably on the Hobbit more than on the original Lord of the Rings, where you know the majority was shot outside. But yeah, there was. It was hot, man. It was, you know, it was 35 degrees outside when we shot that stuff that you've mm. seen in episode three so far. It was really hot. And we, like on The Hobbit, we had cooling suits that were made for us. I, I still didn't wear it. I still don't like to wear a cooling suit and, and cool down. But we had people whose job it was to make sure that we were hydrated. And we had a series of uh, people dressing us to make sure that they could get some of that clobber off um, in between, in between uh, takes when we had breaks because it was hot. It was really hot. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. I well, do. we're coming up on an hour, and I know, and, and I know you've got uh, uh, your time is precious uh, there in New Zealand. But I, one last question um, for me, and then one from Cliff. But my <laughs> my question is, can can you um, can you give us a vibe on? You know, the pandemic happened, every, the world shut down, and New Zealand was the first to go back to work. And there was, you know, the whole country was in lockdown. And it, it felt like it was the only place to work in the world for like six months was in New Zealand. And there, mm. you, there, you know, there's Lord of the Rings shooting the biggest TV show on, in history. Um, can you give a sense of the, uh, the pride of the Kiwis and of New Zealand? and putting mm -hmm. forth their best effort in the show, and how does that compare to the pride of the Kiwi production when Peter Jackson was doing Lord of the Rings? That's a great question. It was the same, you know, that we, ve we as a country know how lucky we are that Peter got the rights back in the day. You know, film tourism up until the pandemic was the second biggest earner in New Zealand after, after the um, farming industry. Um, people coming to see the, those locations and to go to, to Hobbiton, to go to Weta Workshop and to do the whole Lord of the Rings slash Hobbit experience, that was the second biggest earner in our country. So from a financial point of view, we know how important it is, but also from an artistic point of view, it's, it's amazing to us that we got the opportunity of doing this series. And so people took it really, really seriously. Uh, and in terms of health and safety, you know, we, we had tests every week, full PC uh, for all of the makeup people. Um, it was only the actors that were allowed to be on set without masks on. All the crew had to be you know, sanitized in between takes and everything. So we took it seriously to keep the people 
I'm, I'm safe and well as well. But yeah, the pride factor was right up there. We we know that not everyone gets the opportunity of shooting something this important in their country, and so like it was back in the day, people took it. We went to they went to extraordinary lengths to make sure that they were making a really good a really good fist of it. And and again, I was immensely proud to be part of that because a lot of those people are people that I've worked with for you know twenty odd years. That is beautiful, really beautiful. I want to I want to acknowledge that. That's awesome, really awesome. And lastly, from the chat, the, the wonderful folks in the chat are mirroring the exact thing I was thinking to ask you. So uh, from Akam Mahmoudi in the Facebook chat, do you guys mind asking Jed what his favorite moment is, personally speaking, about the whole series Rings of Power so far? Mine is witnessing primetime Khazad Doom and Numenor in all of its glory, and I agree with that. It is really wonderful to see Khazad Doom way, way before it would be renamed Moria, and I love that. It's really strikingly visualized. But you, Jed, what's your favorite thing out of the Rings of Power so far that you're watching as a fan? Look, I'm like you. Um, as, as someone who um, got to see inside Erebor and only saw Moria once, it, once they delved too deep, and um, unearthed the Balrog, unfortunately for them. Um, yeah, Khazad Doom was amazing, and the sets that they built there were amazing. Just the intricacy and, and the lengths that they went to to portray that, it was incredible. And Numenor, you know, having read those books all of those years ago and imagining in my head what it would look like, I think that it was just the most extraordinary, extraordinary um, achievement in terms of what they what they managed to get there. It is. It's incredible. It looks amazing. Those boats, you know, the ships, the new Minorian ships are, are just the most beautiful thing. So, yeah, that yeah. for me, I'm like you. Those two things especially stand out for me, I think. Yeah. I think we're Agreed. Good, I and agree. I yes. have to, and I have to ask, you played Nori, the dwarf, in oh, yeah. the Hobbit trilogy, a $3 billion trilogy. How does it feel to have another nori on the scene in this show <laughs> a whole nother nori i know i know i i'm a, i was a little um it was a bit discombobulating to be honest it was like i kept hearing people talking about this nori character i'm going hang on a minute is someone playing me at an early age i'm not <laughs> sure he was alive back then but yeah um yeah i think that the i think that the um yeah, that whole race of early shire folk that they're creating there is extraordinary. I just think it's the most, some of the most beautiful stuff that I've seen on any of the um, Lord of the Rings, uh, Middle Earth related uh, um, film and television. I think that they're, it's, they're beautiful, like a beautiful race of people that have developed there. And I love what, I love where they're going with it. I'm, I mean, I, there's nothing, there's nothing that I don't like about it so far. It's very hard to pick any one or two things, but yeah, I, I love, I love the um, the half feet. I think they're amazing. Well, that's yeah. Uh, I had to, I had to ask that. Well, that's great, Jed. Uh, man, great. we really pre appreciate you uh, phoning in all the way from New Zealand, and congratulations on on being in this huge show. And and the fans are so excited. And man, I wish we could have hyped this up at Comic Con or earlier. Like your <laughs> presence yeah. in this yeah. show is what fans wanted. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, I, I, I mean, it's it's always difficult not to be able to tell people what you're doing, but I do, I, I like the fact that it's episodical, that we get to see it a little bit each week and we get to wait. You know, I like, as a, as a viewer, I like to have that thing to look forward to every Friday. And, um, and yeah, it just gets better and better from here. And, you know, I would love, um, there's been some noises from... Um, some of the showrunners and from some of the producers as whether I would be interested in doing season two. And of course, I would be so honored to be a part of season two. Well, it's we definitely shooting. want you in season two. Oh, if, yes. Amazon, oh, if, yes. you, if you're watching still, Amazon, get the contract over to him like as soon as possible. Like we, like, yeah. we want Jed, it, I don't know what his fate of wrath is in season one, but you can put him in any other character. I promise you, this guy is multi-talented. Wait, uh, speaking of multi-talented, <laughs> you were at Comic Con. You had like eight different headshots uh, for sale at Comic Con. Like you played that yeah, many characters. Yeah, all the different characters. 
Yeah, I, I want to play, um, I would love to play a wizard, of course. There are definitely creatures I haven't played. Um, I did play Bilbo Baggins for a week when they were testing out the 3D cameras just before The Hobbit. But I would love <laughs> to play one of the Shire folk. I could be literally anyone. Um, just stick me in there and um, even the back end of a horse, I would be happy to be whatever. <laughs> that is a great, that's a great reference to the ultimate worst job in theater. Everyone says, and what is the worst job you can have as an actor? And that's to be in any pantomime for Christmas and be the back end of the horse. You know, that's what any actor would say lovingly and jokingly. That's the most difficult and underappreciated job is the guy who's in the the Christmas play to in the back end of the horse or the mule. The, the chat room it. just said hashtag, hashtag wrath for season seven. Yep. They want you to survive, Jed. The fans are going to make a new hashtag for you, Jed. Yes. Brilliant. I love it. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, folks, you can catch Jed Brophy uh, on any of your favorite DVDs, extended edition. And now, every week on Rings of Power, uh, because the orcs have just been introduced and they are a major player and a major race to reckon with in this entire series. And we're so excited um, to have Jed Brophy on just as, um, just as the orcs uh, were introduced this week. And, and Do you know Jed what a difference it is that they're not digital? I mean, I'm not trying to complain about the Hobbit trilogy because I try not to that. Uh, but really, the prosthetics, the real life presence of those actors and the whole scene with the water, offering the water bottle and it being a cruel trick to slice the throat of the other elf and all, all this tension. I don't think mm. any of the tension that we're experiencing would be the same if it were just CGI orcs trying to interact with the other human actors. I don't think it would work the same. No, it wouldn't. Some yeah, so, something happens when you have a soul inside of the thing. There's something, you know, actors take their own time. They have their own organic kind of time in terms of creating that tension. It happens between people naturally in theatre and it happens on a film set. You can't do that with CGI characters. There's something missing. There's that interaction between people is missing. And I think you're quite right. I think that they were very smart to go back to practical effects because it's it's a step up. You get You get that indefinable quality that happens between individual actors that you don't get with CGI characters. Jet, is there any, uh, is there any uh, uh, speech, black speech, in, uh, uh, that you can recite for us? Or Kuzduel of the dwarves? What, what, what is your favorite language from Tolkien? I, I, love, I love a bit of Kuzduel, and I will say to everyone out there, Ikfried Ulsul Kazad, feel the fire of the dwarves. Um, I like a bit of Elvish too. I can say happy birthday. Noveden Eren Ador in Onad Lin. Anyone out there having a birthday? Um, and for anyone out there that wants to hear a bit of black speech, Wushanampuk. And you can work out what that means later on. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and Jed, where, can, can, wow. That, can, can people uh, get you on Cameo singing, uh, saying happy birthday to people? Absolutely, I'm on Cameo, and I've just done a couple actually this week, and I, I do say happy birthday to people in various um, languages from Middle Earth, so yeah. And, and um, are you got any conventions coming up? Um, yeah, I'm off, to, I'm off to MagicCon in Germany at the beginning of October. That used to be RingCon. It was one of the original ones that we went to 20-something years ago. I've oh, been wow. going 20 years. Still run by Mark Ferguson, Gil Galad. Um, and and the wonderful Hal Deer, Craig Parker, and the new Gil Galad is going to be there this year, as is Owain, and and um, Ben Walker the, uh, will be there. Yeah, exactly right. So um, yeah, so it's going to be a it's going to be a kind of a a, a bit of a an old and new. I think Aidan Turn is going to be there this year, and Adam Brown's going to be there from the Hobbit. So it's going to be um, it's going to be great. And then who knows. Like, I will go to any convention that wants to put me on a plane because I love meeting the fans all around the world. You are the best fans on the planet, bar none. You heard it, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, Jed Brophy says you are the best fans in the world, and you heard it here first. The meeting of the Gil Galads. Gil Galads. Gil yeah. Glad? <laughs> ah. However, I, 
<laughs> will we'll take place at MagicCon in Germany uh, in just a couple short weeks. And before we let you go, we have to remind everybody, come to L.A. because Bilbo's birthday is coming up in just uh, this oh, weekend, right? It's right around the corner. Yeah. Right? It's not so this coming weekend. It's next weekend. It's the 24th. It's the 24th. Uh, we're going to celebrate Hold Bilbo Baggins' birthday in Griffith Park. Uh, we're expecting hundreds of fans, cosplay, dancing, potluck, food, cake, singing Gandalfs, dancing hobbits. Um, it's yes. going to be an amazing time. And singing Harfoots, I am sure of it. So make sure you plan your weekend in, in uh, week after next to come to Bilbo Baggins' birthday bash uh, here in Los Angeles in Griffith Park. And Cliff, um, I'm just so pleased how this show is going. I'm and thrilled. I, I'm thrilled because... You know, there's a new hashtag we probably need to make for the One Ring.net, and it's called hashtag Justin Never Tells Me Anything. And under that banner, he has surprised <laughs> me so many, many weeks on this live stream show with, oh, look what's happening. We've got blah, blah, blah. I didn't know that was happening. And here you are, Jed, by far, Jed Brophy, the biggest surprise and the best surprise. And the audience here are very faithful faithful audience who come and join us every week to talk in good faith and with good energy to uplift one another and to never bring anyone down and to actually talk about these rigorous exploration of ideas comparing original Tolkien and how we appreciate Tolkien compared to the adaptations that are that are coming at us left and right um, there's such an appreciation for you Jed and it comes through the audience the audience is here saying, and you'll get to look at it later on, I'm sure, but just looking at all the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people saying that you're the best and they're thrilled to have you, and I, uh, I second that emotion. Just thrilled to have you with us back in Middle Earth. Thank you, Jed Brophy. And also thank you to Justin for not spoiling the surprise. That was really fun. That was really fun. Uh, fo fo folks, it, it, uh, me and Jed were uh, talking right before the show, and we're like, we're not going to tell Cliff. And then I just felt like uh, we have to tell Cliff. And uh, his, the shocked look on your face was amazing. But Jed, <laughs> final words as we sign off tonight. Yes. To all of you out there who are enjoying um, the new series on Prime and have loved Tolkien's work from, from a very young age, I am the lucky Kiwi. I have um, had an amazing career Never thought that I would get to do this. I grew up not far away from Mount Doom and Mount Ruapehu. And here I am, the lucky Kiwi, getting to um, be in my favourite franchise of all time. And you are the most wonderful fans. Justin and, um, and Clifford, thank you very much for having me. And from everyone here in Aotearoa, Middle Earth, New Zealand, kia ka, ara nui, ka kite. Peace! <laughs> Bye, Jed. Thank there you, There it man. is, Jed Brophy. Folks, you can find bye bye. him every week on Rings of Power. He plays the character Vrath, and I'm sure he'll be posting so little cool. nuggets on his Instagram and Twitter, which are linked well, in the bio. Now he doesn't have to keep it secret anymore. That's the cool part. Now Jed Brophy is no longer bound by the massive non-disclosure agreement. He can actually talk everything that about the Rings of Power. And guess what we found out? You know how out? long we've been holding on to that information? You, you know how long we've been just tight lipped Amazon? We're be we're playing nice. We are playing. Wait till you see Galadriel's first kiss. Cliff, <laughs> we're at Scum and Villainy Cantina in Hollywood. Uh, we're no. happy to be here. No, Thank you, no. JC, and all the friendly staff here. Open to the public. Bring your kids. Cliff, take us out. So glad to keep my mouth shut about Jed Brophy. We've known for a very long time, but that's what we do very well. We keep secrets as best as we can. But I want to say thank you again to the beautiful audience. We have a lovely live audience here at Scum and Villainy Cantina. Acknowledgement to all the patrons of Scum and Villainy and to the hardworking staff, very hardworking staff. Lovely to have you guys here. And thank you, JC, for letting us bring the show to you, broadcast from this wonderful, wonderful location here in the heart of Los Angeles. Uh, but and if you, if you join our Discord, there yes. is a special, join special cliff command. <laughs> and if you do exclamation point cliff on our Discord, it brings up my famous last words. We will see you all next week, next Tuesday, everybody. Take good care of yourselves and be gentle with one another. Until then... I love to say good night and good luck, or better yet, buenos noches y buena suerte. Bye. Bye.